right now there is a 20 second lag so hello namaste and welcome to the first public conversation at samvad boston my name is mesma belseri and i am the co-founder of samvad along with the odissi dancer priya bangal at samvad we intend to bring up conversations that are relevant to the world of indian classical music and dance you can read about our mission statement in the uh, youtube description box in the interest of time i shall not go into it but today's hot topic is a tradition that dates back not just a few centuries but a few millennia a tradition that did not spare even a god figure like krishna from serving in the gurukula of rishi sandipani in order to acquire knowledge that is the guru shishya parampara uh, an indian system of education that rests on two basic principles the first is an uninterrupted transfer of knowledge from a teacher to a student over a prolonged association between the two and the second being the sustenance and preservation of a lineage uh, and the continuation of that lineage over a prolonged period again and um, this system is a far cry from the institutionalized education methods with which we are all quite familiar and although this practice has faded away from almost all contemporary methods of educating the world of indian classical music and dance still uh, observes it it's still prevalent in our in the way we teach and learn our arts now the uh, critics of this practice have uh, raised questions on its relevance in our post post modern world uh, some have denounced the inherent power dynamics in it uh, while some have even suggested a complete overhaul uh, a complete uh, abolishment of this practice and in order to get some clarity on this complex issue we have invited two eminent and prominent active artists in their fields samarth nagarkar who is a hindustani vocalist and maithili prakash who is a bharatanatyam dancer again in the interest of time i shall not go into the extensive bios you may read them in the description box on the youtube page that you're watching the format of this conversation will be as follows each panelist will be given 3 minutes to express their views on this topic and in those 3 minutes they will put forth two specific points in support of their argument at the end of that the three of us will have a conversation after which you the audience members will get to ask the panelists questions you can enter your questions at any time in the chat box on the youtube page that you're watching so without any further delay i will invite samarth nagarkar to share his views on this topic samarth namaskar first of all uh, thank you uh, samvad uh, for creating this opportunity for all of us to sit down and meditate on this subject this is a very profound subject that hits very close to home uh, having experienced uh, living and learning in the guru shishya parampara myself so there are a lot of historical artistic uh, you know the different layers and complexities that this the method of guru shishya parampara brings into the way the music is taught but i would lay down two very uh, significant large uh, broad points uh, to begin with firstly i think traditional art forms across the world especially 
forms like uh, raga music and dance indian classical dance an artist is not alone uh, we cannot claim to be you know as they say swayambhu like I'm, i've come out of nowhere and i have this all art that's coming out of me because talent is one thing it's a very important aspect but to be a participant in this tradition to be a practitioner of a traditional art form is to be a part of a flowing abundant river and in that river there is knowledge there is experience and there is artistry what the guru shishya parampara does is not just it's not just a learning and teaching environment it's not just a trans, you know passing on of you know i'm teaching you something and you're learning something it's not just about the repertoire or the technique or the grammar of the of the dance or music and the stylistic thing it's that's just one part of it but there is this transmission it's not just a learning and teaching but it's a transmission of that experience of that knowledge of that artistry of the feeling that goes into it the ability you know to i can teach a student to sing in sur to sing tunefully but to experience dissolving yourself into that music that is an experience that comes with total immersion that a system like guru shishya parampara has given us essentially it is immersion it is you go and be in your guru's presence uh, for a extended period of time immersing yourself in the art form that is what guru shishya parampara embodies now the second point is that any artistic tradition which has evolved through centuries accumulates good and bad practices over time this is a given i mean any industry it's not just indian classical music or dance but any industry over time accumulates good and bad practices and there are social political economical all kinds of reasons that contribute to these changes now as representatives or practitioners of the art form we it's a responsibility to be acutely aware of these changes constantly inspect them introspect and filter out what are the good things of this parampara that we need to retain and what are the things that need to be rejected what are the things that don't have relevance or maybe it was a norm at some point of time but we have to examine and say is that right or is that wrong or is that relevant or is that not relevant and we have to be honest enough to eliminate those bad practices from our uh from the way we perceive the art from the way we teach the art from the way we practice the art so those are my two uh, uh my my two major philosophies that i would like to present today that it is a transmission and a wholesome transmission so the guru shishya parampara which brings in emotion is important and at the same time we have to be very responsible in constantly being honest and introspecting and filtering out the good and bad practices from this parampara from time to time can i shall i go ahead well thank you samarth for that oh. yes i will now invite maithili to express her views um thank you again samarth mezma for having me as a part of this Um I'm glad that Samarth went first because a lot of what he said kind of sets up I'd like to kind of take that further. Um I think that this guru shishya relationship is something that is so complex and nuanced and you know there's no one size fits all it really depends on the dynamics between the two individuals. But I think there's a certain specificity with the guru shishya that makes it distinct from the teacher student and um that has a lot to do with the intention of the form i know that it's this way with dance i'm sure it's similar with music if not the same but um the roots of the form has its association in prayer and in worship and so the intention of the form is in a sense this idea of displacement of the i displacement of the ego like samarth said dissolving into the music and so um that that's an ideal that we're constantly striving at that the art is seen as larger than the artist and um and this submission to the art that is kind of the goal in the practice um 
And so that's where the role of the guru comes in, because for a student who's entering the field of learning, this it takes time and maturity, you know, relationship with the learning process. So the guru becomes this tangible entity that, um, you know, cultivates this relationship of trust and enables in the student a love and a devotion and eventually submission for the art form. And so while the role of the guru is, you know, to teach and impart and train and whatever, I think the deeper role of the guru, the reason we have the word guru, this idea of the dispeller of darkness, which is kind of the, the meaning of the word, I think goes back to this purpose of displacing the self, which is that the guru's role is to push the shishya um, to places, kind of to edges of comfort zones and, um, and pride and things like that to kind of push because at those moments of, of breakthrough and discovery is where we gain depth with the art form. Um, and it's the shishya's role to, to really be open and, and receive that process. You know, we have that, the namaskaram where the head is placed at the, shishya's head is placed at the feet of the guru. And I think that's so symbolic of this complete surrender or faith that's put in the guru. Um, but that being said, I think that's also where things become really tricky and things need to be constantly reassessed because when there is this complete trust and faith and when that is seen as power, um, and there's misuse of power, then I think the whole system collapses because when the shishya has to feel any kind of doubt or caution or wariness, I think that's when there cannot be that implicity of trust. And I think um, now more and more is coming to light about practices that are unacceptable, um, abuse that act in very outright ways. But, but I think what's also challenging is that there is the more subtle forms of um, power play that are kind of very embedded in our psyche, in our thought and behavior patterns, um, and sometimes unrecognizable and become part of the part of the process unknowingly. And I think that's where things need to be really examined um, and seen what is serving the learning and what is serving the ego and what serves the ego, there is no place for it. Um, and the last thing I just want to say is, I think the second point is that um, the psychological makeup of everyone is changing with social media. And I think especially for the shishya, the constant pressure to put oneself out there in the public eye to get validation and likes and always kind of present a favorable image feels an antithetical to this process um, where one is constantly taking oneself apart, you know, and so when one is concerned with the placement of the self, but also has to be displacing the self, I think energies become squandered and that single minded focus is not something that our environment is so conducive of. And so for the guru and the shishi, I think there's a lot of responsibility that needs to be kept in mind. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> You're muted. Oh, mess. You're both very good at keeping the time. I can see you're both performers. So thank you for that. Uh, you know, we'll just jump right in. Uh, I think that uh, we are getting, we're starting to get some really interesting questions, uh, but I do have one uh, question for you both. Uh, so I will pose it uh, first to Samad and then Maitri, you can answer it also. Um, I'm going to change this view to the gallery. Okay, now, what I want to know is that you've both weighed in both aspects of, of this parampara. There are pros and cons from like in any system. Could you summarize for us, what is it that this in this parampara that needs to be absolutely saved under any circumstances? Uh, am I going first? Um, definitely the idea of trust, definitely the idea that, um, uh, without the trust that, that exists between the guru and the shishya, uh, it's impossible for this art form to actually go to the heights that it has in the past and can in the future. It's an ongoing process. I mean, the actual form might keep changing if you look at the music that was there 100 years ago and the music that is there today and then I presume it's the same with dance it changes but it's a stream it's an ongoing stream that 
you know, gain some, loses some, but through that process, there is an integrity to the art form that remains. And for that integrity to last, there is an element of trust that has to be kept between the Guru and the Shishya. And when there is that trust, then a system like the Guru Shishya Parampara can actually thrive. Then there is the element of the repertoire of music. So look, hundred. if I go back to a little bit of history, there was a time when this music was not passed on very easily. At least in, in the Hindustani musical uh, tradition, there was a time when people held on very jealously to their music. They would teach it only to their own uh, you know, children or people within the family and we wouldn't teach it to people outside of our family. The justification was of course that we don't want to give this to somebody who we don't trust implicitly and who we don't know what they're going to do with this music and we're going to give it to people only once we know that they're able to take this up and give it its due, uh, you know, and justify you know, and they can actually take it up and be good representatives of this music until then we won't part with this inner circle. We'll teach them some stuff but not the whole uh, uh, art. That has it has its pros and cons, right? Today we see that everybody is using a little bit of some snippet of some raga that they heard and they're using it all over the place. Compositions are getting distorted and everything that's happening now. But I'm I guess... I'm sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt you. So we move on to Maithili regarding this point. You can come back to that point later. There are some questions that will lead to what you were saying. So I want to pass it on to Maithili to tell us what is it about this parampara that ne absolutely needs to be preserved under any circumstances. I think I echo Samarth's point. I think trust is absolutely essential. And I think that um, for me, it goes back to the idea of intention, the idea of always being a student, always um, having that, the knowledge or the process being above you and always having that thirst to go deeper into the form. I think that's kind of the bedrock of, of this, whole system of learning you know there's never the sense of accomplishment like I'm there it's always this and I think the guru that idea of the guru being here and the shishya being here creates that sense of constant awareness that I am here I am I am the student if that so to qualify that statement that both of us made I'd like to add that the onus of building this trust lies with the guru yes absolutely. Uh, so if the gurus misplace misuse that uh, you know, that the, the equation that Maithili just mentioned, the Guru is here and the Shisha is here as far as the art is concerned. If, if that element is kind of uh, not uh, you know, nurtured in the right way, then it can get messy. That's when the power dynamics come and it gets really, it's, it gets into really dark places because of that. So it's important to keep that element uh, you know, in mind that it's up to the gurus to, to maintain that focus as far as the art is concerned and how we are going to direct the student towards artistic. If you surrender, surrender to the extent of the art, not art, exactly. your, your, your personal life, your private life is up to you. But as far as the art is concerned, you do exactly as the guru says. Exactly. That's where I think you keep saying as far as the art is concerned. And I think that's like should be in bold because the yeah. guru as a representative of the art and the learning process, that's where the surrender is. Exactly. And when, it's, when you're just surrendering to the person and their whims and, you know, then things become murky and um, the, the line becomes we're not sure what purpose this faith or this trust is serving. Mm -hmm. But can you let me ask you a counter question. Can you always separate the person from the practice. Is it possible to do that, in, especially in the case of a student who is in a position of receiving from the guru? Can one do that? Have you experienced it in your own practice? I think that's where it, it becomes tricky. And like Samarth says, the onus rests on the guru to, um, to be constantly like reevaluating oneself and one's um, one's uh, teaching patterns and behavior because so much I think in our past has become about like rules you know even patriarchy or like the way you know the fa what the father says is correct or what the you know there's this kind of unquestioning it must be this way and I think it's up to the guru to create the um the a dynamic that is empathetic that is compassionate and that allows the shishya to feel like they can have that 
trust, you know, and also have the space to ask questions because the asking questions is important, but the questioning or doubting, I think that's where the trust collapses. I, I agree with, I agree. And in my experience, uh, I've seen that it is possible that I, I have role models uh, in front of me who I have, you know, my gurus and, and several others in the field who have actually managed to keep that balance. They were my own gurus and uh, Dinkar Kaikini and Ulhas Kashalkar and there's people like Firoz Dastur and I mean, there's a long list of people who are who were extremely mindful of their place as domain experts. I am an expert in this field. You have come to learn music from me and I'm going to teach you music and you're not here to do my dishes. You're not here to do either. And in, in the process of that trust, once you become a member of the household sometimes you know when people there, there are those cases where people actually go and live with the gurus and they become a member of the household then they're doing stuff for the house the, it's it's kind of it, then you don't the boundaries are kind of blurred but it's, it's very important that's where the guru's role comes to be the person in power it's like in in a corporate it's the manager's job it's the it's the person at a higher position it's his or her job to make sure that the no lines are being crossed so I think it's the same thing here. The power dynamic lies in the hands of the guru. So he or she gets to draw the line as to this is how far I will allow this to happen. And there were times when my guru used to kind of get mad at me when you know, I was doing too much of other work. And he's like, you've come here to do all this work or I've come here to do music. So you know, go and do your practice first. So this used to, I mean, so it was up to them to kind of redefine and, and you know, course correct whenever things kind of were getting out of hand. And uh, hypothetically speaking, what happens if the guru is not that conscientious about uh, the, these boundaries? Then what happens? Then how does the student uh, evaluate the situation and act in a way that is not damaging to him or her? Unfortunately, this happens a lot. It's not an exception where the guru doesn't draw these boundaries. And from, you know, We've all been here in this field of music and dance for a good few decades now, and we've seen that this is, in all forms, there's misuse of power. And most cases, students are not in a position to decide what to do. And I think that's why such conversations are important, because it also empowers the students to understand that there are lines that should be drawn. And if someone's not keeping to that, if someone is making you do things that are obviously crossing lines, uh, then you should kind of be aware. You know, my Guruji used to say, sit with your Gurus, you know, but there's a thing that just shut your eyes and sit with your Guru and practice and do what he says. He used to say, sit with your Guru and practice and do what he says, but don't shut your eyes. <laughs> Keep your eyes open. You know, metaphorically, you know, not, not literally, but, you know, be aware. Be aware of what's going on around you. Be aware of where you stand, where your guru stands, and it's important. I mean, you have to constantly be exposed to the external world also. And I think that kind of helps. And I think also recognizing that the guru is a, is a human being and is a flawed person, you know, because it's, it's also so much in our practice to romanticize the guru as this like a uh, personification of God or, you know, because we see music or dance as divinity. And so to us, they represent a certain divinity. But I think that it's the teaching and the process that is divine. It is not the person as the human. So they're going to have you, there will be misunderstandings. There will be situations where there, you know, something, the ego gets hurt. And I think it's also the role of the student to be compassionate and understand that, you know, they're they're a person, you know, we yeah. can't expect them to be like. I, right. I completely agree. So we have all of these Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devu, Maheshwara. And, but I think those were different, you know, they were Brahma Gyani Gurus. They were okay. spiritual Gurus of a different kind that, and this ideal that, that was taught. But when you're talking about Gurus of a certain art form, of a certain uh, skill, and I think, I think you have to kind of bring that expectation of your Guru a little lower. You don't expect them to be the all-knowing, all, you know, all potent and they know everything and they're like, it doesn't have to be. A Guru in an art form 
could be a great person, a wonderful person if he's, you know, aware of things and if he's constantly thinking. Thing is, in our music, I've seen in my experience that we spend decades and decades practicing and trying to improve ourselves as human, as musicians. Not many people take the same time and effort to actually develop ourselves as human beings, as people. Mm-hmm. So sometimes it happens, sometimes one feeds into the other, but sometimes it doesn't. So that's why we come across these people who are phenomenal musicians, but are terrible as people sometimes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it diff- becomes difficult for people to reconcile those two things. And when somebody hears something bad about somebody, they're like, but his music is such so good. How can he be a bad person? Mm-hmm. You know, so it is possible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. they are human. Gurus are human. And we have to look at that perspective very you know, clearly. Right. Thank you. Um, we are getting some questions and there is a constant flow of questions. There's, a, there's, a un, there's an underlying current of theme in the mm-hmm. questions that um, I would like to summarize in one that uh, even I had. Um, so let's assume that we live in a world where we, we have done away with this parampara. This parampara does not exist anymore. Um, what in your experience and estimation will or might replace that? I mean, just right off the bat, I think that <clears throat> things would become very clinical if it was not, you know, if this was done away with. I think that what's so beautiful about the form, and of course, I'm just speaking offhand, like the first thing that's come to my mind is there's so much like there's a magic and a beauty about the forms that are in the lived experience of the of the guru and the sharing of that with the student that i think when things um when that that relationship and that continuity and the the dynamic between the guru and the shishya is lost i think things would become a little more clinical and perhaps a little bit of that magic um, and that experientiality, I guess, if that's a word, um, would would be lost, I think. Samat? Yeah, I think uh, we actually, it's not that much of a hypothetical situation. <laughs> <laughs> because there have been changes that have happened. That's why I was going into the history of, of this parampara, of how there was a time when music was only an oral tradition. It used to be taught only from a guru to a shishya. There was no ragas written down. There was no grammar written down. There was no explanation given, the guru teaches and you learn and the compositions were taught and the methodology of thinking was taught, period. And then that's where this thing became a closed, you know, click. I mean, I will teach it only to these students and I will not teach it to these students. They sometimes even teach wrong compositions just because this person, I don't trust this person, he might go and do something wrong with it. So I'm not going to give him the real thing. I'll teach him half the composition and not teach him the rest. These are things that have happened in the past. So to counter this and to say that this, 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 he, there was this person called Bhatkhande, Vishnu Narayan Bhatkhande, about 100 years ago. He mm-hmm. said, we, have, uh, we are at the risk of losing a lot of the repertoire. So let's create some kind of a bank where all of these things are stored. So he created textbooks, he compiled compositions, he created a notation system. He did a lot of work that kind of standardized this music, which was important for the time at that time and he also created a mass education system of music because music in the general households can now if you're learning music it was actually considered a, a bad thing oh your this child is going to go he's going to lose his way he's going to you know become lost or confused that was the kind of narrative that was on around 100 150 years ago so to change that Bhatkande said let's create a system of you know, college school education, which is which ha- assumes the stamp of uh, respectability. So now you're going to a school or a college and learning this music sort of a thing. He created a curriculum and then the curriculum was taught. Now what has happened 100 years later is those things that were taught through the curriculum became the standards. So we have a whole lot of people who are practicing this music, teaching this music. Schools are being, you know, are, are being formed every day and people are teaching who don't have the kind of training that came from the Guru Shisha Parampara. So what has happened is the st- standard of music in those cases has drastically reduced. And the, even the perception of, okay, this actually exists, and this is the actual music, and what we are doing is only 
something that was done to preserve or something that was done as an information, okay, a broad bird's eye view of what the music is, that element was lost. So I think if we kind of throw away the parampara, we are losing out on that element of uh, connect that, is, that an artist has with the music. You can, your ragas might be correct, you might be right by the textbook, you might, your technique might be great and your, you might have all your, uh, your foots, footsteps are correct, everything is correct. But that element of what goes beyond this, what takes this into the territory of art, mm -hmm. that might actually be lost if mm -hmm. we get rid of the Guru Shisha Parampara. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. I, th I think to some extent also, I feel concerned because even if the, even with the Guru Shishya, like, you know, system in place, it's not the same level of immersion now, you know, like we have even the kind that I got, I, I didn't live in a Gurukulam, but I lived with my mom, who was my teacher. And our home was constantly full of dance, music, rehearsals, classes, like it was a dance space before it was a home, you know. And so that idea of knowledge of music, of, of rhythm, of tala, of text, of mythology like it's all so much a part of the art form you know so it's not something where even now I see students you know we they come to class once or twice a week and they learn for an hour then they go home and do something else and you know it's it's obviously a way of learning but it's not an immersed way of learning and it will change the art form the way it's passed down in the future you know because it's like without when we think of our predecessors who it was their life their life was dance and and their like it wasn't dance separate, you know? And so it, it, it was so infused, their, their art was so infused. And I find that I, I'm, I'm worried about how to, is that a possibility for our future, you know? Hmm. Thank you. Um, there's a great question that came in. I'm just going to now segue into asking questions from the audience members. There's some very uh, wonderful questions coming in. I would request uh, the audience members to keep your questions short uh, I see that there's some long paragraphs of statements. It would be helpful if you kept your question short. Thank you. Um, so this question is for both of you. At some point, an artist needs to break away from the guru's umbrella without breaking away from all that has been taught. My question is, when is the right time? Mathilde, you want to go first? I'll go. Um, the way I see it, for, because for me, you know, my mom is my guru, but I'm also mentored by Malavika Sarukai. And so um, is she a mentor? Is she a guru? Like, what is she? I don't know how to like label that relationship. But for me, I, I think also because it was my mom, it wasn't a breakaway, you know, so it was a kind of, it's a, she's always been very free with allowing me to seek guidance where I feel I need it. But I think that when I think of, for me, I would translate this question into a what is, I guess, the difference between the guru and like the mentor or, you know, the, the, what's it called? Further learning that you continue with somebody else. And I think the guru's role is to kind of hand you this treasure, you know, and make, prepare you for that journey and, and um, prepare you to make sure you are strong enough to hold it, to know the value of what it is that you're holding and um, to kind of lay that foundation. And when you go on to somebody else, or a mentor or some, you know, something like that for further training, I think that relationship with the art has been established. Um, and it's, it's a kind of an excavation and a digging deeper, finding more within this art and a play so that this art form that you've been handed in or holding is now becoming a part of you. And, um, and I think that, that if possible, that connection with the guru should be there, there should be, you know, it's ideal, that's, it's ideal that that's the case, that there's no break and there's no done being done with one thing and starting something else. It's a continuous flow. I think that's also where it's difficult because again, gurus are human beings. Like nobody wants to accept that like, okay, this student has, I've given all that I can to this student and now they're ready for something more, you know? So that it's, it, it is difficult. It, it sometimes makes that break uh, difficult, but I think that the, the, sh we can ideally say the shishya knows when they're seeking something that they're not getting, I guess. I don't know. It's, it's tricky. Yeah, uh, there's multiple interpretations of this, uh, of the term breaking away from the Guru's umbrella. One is an internal breaking away. One is breaking away from a physical 
uh, you know, your your actual being with your guru and learning from the guru. Mm-hmm. For the for the latter, where you're actually st- you know studying with the guru and learning from the guru, um, I think if the student wants to move away to another guru and learn from, that is okay. But after one has achieved a reasonable amount of time with one guru. And I think mm-hmm. that time comes when the, both the guru and student know that, okay, this is, you've, you've as, you know, achieved quite a bit of training from me. You've imbibed a lot of the things that I have taught you. Now, if you want to go to learn from somebody else, that's fine. Or the Shisha says that I've, I feel that I want to learn this aspect from somebody else. It's a very good thing. My guru actually encouraged that. Both my gurus encouraged that. Uh, because they have also experienced this, uh, and so they and their gurus, Gajanan Rao Joshi, actually learning completely from the Gwalior tradition, from two his own father, uh, as in Maithili's case, his father also was a his guru, and he learned from him for several years. Went to another guru from the same gharana, and then when he was a performing artist, he went and learned from a third, a second gharana. And that guru said, well, you're already, you've learned this style. You're actually a performing artist of this style. Why do you want to learn this? He said, no, I really want to. So I, he, he promised him, said, I will not perform for the next five years. I will give up performances and I will become your student and learn from you. So, and he was accepted because by then he had already assimilated Gwalior Gharana Gaiki. So then when he went to a different Gaiki, it was, he was starting from scratch, but then it's not like he was torn between the two elements. There was enough clarity with one style. So that is the, the second kind of breakaway I thought. And I think it's it's encouraged, but as long as you've finished a, a reasonable amount of learning from your first guru. The second kind, which is an internal breakaway, because you can't always, you're not following your footsteps of the guru in, this, in a literal sense. The first thing that my guru Kaikiniji told me when I sat with him to learn was that my job is to awaken the guru within you. And I realized what this meant a good 20 years later, you know, and at that time it felt like a nice statement, but the, the, the truth in that came to me much later after I had learned from him for a good six, seven years, learned from Ulhas Ji for another seven years, been by myself later on practicing, you know, out by, as in, by myself once I finished my, the, the, that period of learning. That's when it kind of hit me that I'm practicing and I'm actually seeing my gurus with me. Mm-hmm. I constantly feel their presence with me when I'm in my music room practicing, when I'm on stage singing. I feel that presence. But yet, it's my own voice. So they never impose their voice or their truth onto you. The guru's job is to let the student discover his or her own truth. So that breakaway process of finding your own voice and your own musical personality happens naturally if the training is of that kind. So are you saying that the flourishing of individual creativity can happen either way, uh, whether you are with a guru or in, you know, you've broken away from it? Is that, is that, is that what you're saying? Uh, what I think broken away needs to be defined a little more clearly. What does broken away mean? I mean, if you have finished your, you know, uh, a reasonable amount of time with your guru and your guru has said, okay, now I think you can go and, you know, go on with your path. You've learned from me now for a good seven, eight years and now maybe go and find your own way mm-hmm. as an artist. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what happened to me. I was at a school called ITC Sangeet Research Academy. Before that, I was with Dinkarji and at SRA, I was with Ulasji. And then it was only when he said I was ready to go out and start off on my own is when I stepped out and I became... I was out there in the world trying to, it's not like you finished learning. It's not like I'm done with all that I had to learn. But no, it, it means that you've come to a place where the guru feels from now on your discovery of yourself as a musical personality, your learning will continue. But it's important for you to find your own voice from here on. Hmm. And the guru feels that he or she has been able to give a reasonable amount of tools for you to find your way from here on. Okay. I'm going to change the course a little bit now. Um, there is a question specifically, uh, specifically for Maithili. Um, Maithili, can you possibly be more specific about the subtle abuses of power in the Guru Shishya Parampara as it relates to social media? Oh, wait, the, sorry, the specific abuses of Can you power? be more specific about the subtle abuse of power 
in the Guru Shishya Parampara as it relates to social media? Um, my, my connection with the subtle abuses of power was actually separate from my point about the connection with social media. Um, my, my bringing up social media was the idea of how the Shishya is changing in terms of um, their investment in the single minded investment in the rigor of the process, because there's also this pressure to constantly be performing, not performing on stage, but on a daily basis, you know, putting one's work out there. So that was something separate. When I was talking about the subtle abuse of power, I think that was more of um, things that are pattern that become behavior and thought patterns in the way that art is, t is taught. Um, it, would you like me to elaborate on that? No, I think I think you've made yourself quite clear. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Samar, this question is for you. Uh, can you give us an example of ragdari music, uh, bad practices in it uh, that should be weeded out? Mm. In the teaching of raga music or in the actual performances, uh, I would assume that because think, we're talking about the Guru Shishya Parampara. I think this is the yeah. In in rag sangeet parampara, uh, some of the there are good practices and I mean there are uh, benign bad practices and there are some practices which are actually harmful. Uh, among the benign practices, I would say things like there used to be this norm, uh, you know, moving away. And, and starting to teach has actually brought my me uh, face to face. It makes me think a lot about these things. And we grew up with a, with this notion that the guru is always strict with you, is very stern with you, and to get a nod from the guru is a big deal. Uh, you know, it was it was you never the guru never says shabash kya baat hai very easily. You know, to get that one approval from him, that validation from him was like this the heaven. Uh, so that aspect, I think I have personally tried to change when I teach my students. I I don't put so much weight on my validation because that creates a, the student to kind of develop the whole kind of insecurities, I feel. And to acknowledge the effort that is going in, to acknowledge that you're putting in a lot of effort, that you're serious about what you're doing. And I think positively reinforcing that behavior of uh, when they practice well, you know, give them the praise. When they do something right, acknowledge that they've done something good. So that kind of actually leads them to do more of that good behavior. So that is the way that I have approached, uh, you know, the, the slight change that I have brought about in, in how I interact with my students. The bad, bad practices, the ones that are definitely not good are the kind of, uh, there are a whole bunch of, uh, how do I say platitudes mm -hmm. that are out there in the world of rock sangeet and presumably in dance as well? Uh, these things have to definitely be examined, and often the student is not in a position to filter out those things. So, on one hand, for instance, you tell a student something like, uh, You have to completely immerse yourself into this music, which is true. You tell him that practice of music is not only about learning, uh, practice is not only about the music and the learning of the music and the technique and everything, but it's also a practice of building endurance, building your, and your perseverance and all of those things, which is true. But then you tell them that, you know, if you do these things sincerely and if you practice like this, then you will definitely get this one day. You know, you will become a great artist if you, anyone who really devotes themselves to this art will definitely be rewarded. That's not true. Mm -hmm. So there are many of these platitudes that are out there, which are served on a platter to students, <laughs> you know, yeah, mix interspersed with good and bad things. You, you know, if you have to be in this field, you have to be prepared to be lonely. If you have, you have to be prepared to be hungry, you're not going to be make a lot of money in this field. If only there's no need for all of those things. And as a society, not just through between a guru and a shishya, but as a society, we need to change these uh, these thought processes and dogmas that have kind of set in. Mm -hmm. And the, the last kind of uh, really bad practices that are there are the kind of power abuse where we romanticize mm -hmm. the guru you know, 
pushing the student to all kinds of lens and the student serving the guru you know, completely. So this romanticization of practice, like you've heard of instances where I don't want to quote any particular instances and, 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 you know, and face backlash for that, but there are instances where gurus have gone to great lengths um, abusing their power just because they can. Yes. Whether it's making the student do things that are not related to music, whether it's uh, asking for favors from the students, getting them to do unreasonably you know, difficult things for them, which takes their time and focus away from the art form, and even soliciting sexual favors and all kinds of things. So those are way beyond doubt bad practices and those have to definitely be acknowledged and there is no structure right now there is no infrastructure to address these things mm -hmm. so i wish yeah. we developed the, our, our infrastructure as a society uh, to address these things and to tackle these things going forward mm -hmm. yeah thank you i can think of at least one archetypal example of ekalavya and dronacharya mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, that kind of an authoritative you could call it abuse of power, you could call it whatever, but the famous story of Eklavya being from the Bhilla or uh, so-called Shudra community and then Dronacharya uh, not being pleased by uh, his uh, devotion to him as a guru and then asking his right thumb in the form of the Guru Dakshina, uh, which renders him unable to, to practice archery, the art to which Eklavya devotes his life. Uh, but of course, there are other reasons why Dronacharya has asked him uh, to, to do that. It's not just uh, an abuse of um, uh, caste, power, or uh, his, his resolve to not teach any Shudra. Uh, it's a political move on his part also. So there's, a, there's, a, there's the other part of the story which is not often told, um, where, uh, Dron uh, where Eklavya, Dronacharya knows that Eklavya is, uh, is, uh, ha has pledged allegiance to Jarasandha, who is the arch enemy of Krishna, and therefore uh, could not uh, be defeated by Arjuna if, uh, if there was a, uh, such, a, such, a, um, such an equality between the two in terms of the skill. Anyway, so there, there, there is the other side of the story that sometimes gets um, obscured or we don't know about it. I have a question for Maithili about um, the practices in the dance world uh, that you think could be altered or uh, is there something that you would like to see being done differently when it comes to this, um, uh, this parampara that we're talking about? Um, so there's one thing that I've just, I've been thinking about a lot, and this is something that I've come to question just in the last week of thinking about this which is this idea of um, the way praise is given, kind of touching upon what Samarth was saying. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's interesting because I always thought that the way I would, my mom was very, you know, kind of minimal with her praise and her, it was always, like he said, like a nod was like, oh my gosh, you know, um, th this idea of constantly never being, never being satisfied or never being complacent and always being so much aware of how much more there is to go. I always took that as something that was so positive because for me, it's made me obsessed with wanting to be better, with wanting to like find growth. But at the same time, I feel that I'm never, there's, there's always this um, dissatisfaction. You know, like my husband always jokes about how I always see 90% of the wrong first before it takes me time to see the 10%. And I, till now, I've always thought that was a wonderful thing. And I've, and I've kind of, when I see students now who are so confident and who are happy with themselves, I've always been like, <laughs> why? You know, you need to see what's wrong first, you know? But then I see more and more, I'm seeing it with my daughter. She's, she's like me. She's very self-critical. And sometimes it becomes a hindrance. You know, it's like when, um, yeah, it just, it becomes a hindrance. And we're trying to work through that, like Samad said, positive reinforcement where the effort is given, you know, attention and so I'm just seeing more and more that um, there has to be this blending. And I don't know how, I don't know where the balance lies because sometimes I do feel like there is a sense of entitlement or a sense of, um, I miss that thirst and that obsessive hunger in like present day generation sometimes. And I wonder how we negotiate that, um, that pushing with also the in building confidence in them. And, um, and there's one more thing, which is also the sense of etiquette. 
which um, which is so much a part of our our training process as well. It's uh, the way to speak to somebody senior to you, the way to, um, to like to respect that the knowledge and the experience of either your teacher or your mentor or even an artist that's senior to you. And I think that in present generations, there's this increased sense of equity. Um, and I don't know where that holds place in the training of the art form, um, because I think that this is this is a very simple example, but like when I hear young students saying to an older artist, oh, good luck, or like, hey, you did a great job. Like, that's just not part of the etiquette of our learning. You know, I never say good luck to my teacher. I never say, you know, there's a way of speaking. And, and I don't know, how, like the intention is very nice. It's very, it's coming from a good place, you know? So is it stuff that we teach? Um, and there's things like, you know, like a, a young child of one of my friend's daughters wrote a message to my mom saying she's five years old. And she said, you know, you're a great teacher and you're improving so much, you know, <laughs> and so and it's so sweet. It's so cute. But like, that's the how when do we start like speaking to that mentality and saying, you know what, there's a certain way to speak to your um, your seniors, you know, so things like that are just things that I wonder about um, where I feel like I'm not sure. There's other things where you know in in the training process. Uh, my thing, yeah. But is this is this uh, is this does this have to do with the parampara itself, or is this more of a personal take on? Is is this your personal experience around it, or or are you speaking for the entire uh, this tradition uh, that is revered? Don't um, you think? I, I mean, I I should ask both of you. Don't you think that this is part of that the idea of etiquette and the idea. Um, and these, this idea of equity, like, don't you think that is part of the parampara? Like, isn't that in the passing of knowledge and all of that, isn't that, aren't those um, cultural behaviors part of the, the system? Uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, tricky subject in the sense that it, 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 there are lots of areas that, are, that need to be looked at from both angles. There is, like we discussed before, as as people there can be equity as humans yes. there is equity but when it comes to the art form the guru is a guru and the student is something someone who's trying to learn that so to take your own example of a guru coming up and saying great job to a guru you'll be like what do you even know to say yeah. to say that i did a great job now yeah. how how on what basis have you assessed that i've done a great job is, is that's what maithili's uh you know take is i, I presume so my I understand that it's kind of again up to how the guru. Uh, I have had to face this. I very honestly, I, this resonates with me as well. And often I have to recognize that it's the intention that matters. Mm. If the intention is pure, intention is coming from a good place, and I take that. I take that as a compliment. I take that as a, you know, a good wish from somebody. But also passing on the etiquette and passing on this element of you know you have to understand certain um it's just like we teach a kid how to how to present himself in society you know when you go to when you meet somebody you, you ask how they're doing you know you know when you when somebody gives you a compliment you respond with another compliment there are things which we teach children and they learn from watching mm -hmm. and someone says hey you're looking good today you can't you you, you say something back to them and say are yeah, you too you're looking nice whatever I mean, i'm just an example you don't just say thank you and go away mm -hmm. it's kind of awkward mm -hmm. so Things like that. These are etiquettes that are taught to people in, in normal social interactions. So we teach these things to people in, in our musical interactions as well. Just to say that you know, uh, it's a part of building up EQ. If you are sitting in a green room with an artist, the green room is there to, for the artist to kind of sit and get into a certain mental space. Mm -hmm. He or she is preparing for the concert, you know, envisioning the performance. And at that time, if a student is sitting there in the room, what how how is how are they supposed to behave? Are they supposed to just start being chatty with everybody because it's all equal and everybody's just having mm -hmm. a chat, or are you supposed to kind of be there and just in your presence, in your mental state, you're enabling your guru, you're sending out that positivity, that that energy that is kind of help your guru to you know better himself or herself in the performance. So these are part of the emotional. I mean, you could call them etiquette. You can call them just how you know behaviors. And and if it's something that is rooted in reason, then yes, I would teach that. 
just as I would teach this to a kid who is growing up in society. But if it's not rooted in reason, then I would mm -hmm. kind of yeah. not mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. keep mm -hmm. that in mind. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question for both of you. Uh, some argue that we need to have a quote unquote dispassionate debate about this issue uh, that is not colored by our own experiences with our own gurus. Uh, that this is a larger systemic issue uh, rather than an individual issue. Uh, so the question is, what do you say to those individuals who claim to be victims of, uh, of the system of the power imbalance or uh, who have suffered psychological, emotional uh, trauma uh, or even economic hardship uh, under this parampara and in some cases physical or even sexual abuse? What do you say to them? Oh, it's absolutely unacceptable. And my heart goes out to them. I mean, when I said earlier on that there, I had role models of people who had made this work, I also said that I've seen more than enough instances where this hasn't worked, where the guru draws the line and, and respects the space and the dignity of a student. Um, and you're right, we have to have dispassionate uh, discourses. I mean, you can uh, one. The experience always colors the dis, uh, the, co the conversation yeah. and our experience. You can't say I'm not going to use my experience in my thinking. It has to. It will. But that doesn't mean you're not compassionate about another person's experience. That doesn't feel that. Uh, uh, it's just like uh, when when the Me Too movement was happening. It just because it didn't happen to me doesn't mean it didn't happen to somebody else. So uh, I completely. Uh, no, my heart goes out to anybody who's suffered, who's endured any kind of abuse, sexual or non-sexual abuse. And I definitely feel that that's unacceptable. And we have to create an infrastructures mm -hmm. that allow these people to come out and stand and speak. And we have to unequivocally support them and, and make sure that these practices are completely rooted out of our system. There's no, there's no two doubts about it. Samad, what will that infrastructure look like in your installation? Uh, uh, there are multiple things. There's no one answer to that question. But we can do small things uh, such as, I have two or three ideas. We have, we don't have like a overarching body of, you know, musicians and dancers that kind of dictates all these things. And if, as soon as you create an organization, you're going to have another, its own set of new politics mm -hmm. and corruption creeping into it. So that's mm -hmm. redundant. But what we already have in Indian classical music and dance is institutions like ICCR, Sangeet Natak Academy, UGC, which is the, Uni the University Grants Commission in India, which uh, manages all the universities and the way music is taught in the universities. These institutions actually have the power to do these things. For instance, create a hotline, create an 1-800 number where anybody who is experiencing any kind of harassment or abuse can just call and, lay and and file a complaint. That person doesn't have to file a charge. It doesn't have to be a police complaint. It doesn't have to be an FIR, but they just have to say that I've been going through this. And if Sangeet Narek Academy, for instance, or ICCR has a, you know, like eight, 10 complaints coming about a certain artist, there is a database that's being created that this artist is a serial abuser of his power over his students in whatever way. Mm -hmm. And if they have that database, they have to think twice. When ICCR empanels an artist, they are actually saying that we have this person as an impaneled artist. So students from abroad who go to India to learn this music, looking at that list, trusting ICCR and going to learn from them. And tomorrow, if, if musicians from ICCR start misbehaving, is ICCR taking accountability? So they, are they doing a background check before the impanel artists that relates to not just their musical skills and a few referral letters from big artists, but also uh, why doesn't UGC have an upward... Uh, review why aren't students given a yearly survey where they rate their gurus in terms of their extra musical behaviors okay. i'm here to learn music from you or dance from you mm -hmm. which is great i can't i'm not in a position to review how you behave uh, how you teach me mm -hmm. i can't but in terms of other behaviors mm -hmm. is your guru kind is your guru abusing you is your guru kind of there, there has to be anonymous surveys that students are given every year right. and based on that the, the student, the guru's job at the university can be at risk. Right. So if we have all these small things in place, the gurus are going to be, the gurus that abuse their power are going to think twice or going to have deterrence, actual deterrence. Tomorrow, if somebody complains against the guru, 
His job is at risk. He's not going to be impaneled. He's never going to get a Sangeet Natak Academy Award. You know, so these are actual direct steps that can be taken. But then there also so needs let's to... Not... Sorry, continue. Uh, uh, just a little addition to that. Let's not forget that absolute power will corrupt absolutely. Uh, so, you know, either way, when you invest power on either side of the equation, it can easily tip, the balance can easily tip. So there could be abuse of power on the other side also. Uh, so we need to... In the sense? Uh, in the sense that if, if, if the students have the entire power to call someone out, and if there are, there are systems of, uh, you know, putting someone down and, and there are, there's jealousy involved, or a professional rivalry involved, that can get abused easily too. Yeah, but if you look around and see the number of times that students have misused this power versus the number of times that students have actually been victims of their guru's abuse, I think there's an overwhelming uh, you know, to balance to the other side where mm -hmm. there's actually been abuse mm -hmm. that has gone unreported yeah. and that's... Yeah, right now because say. the power inv is invested on one yeah. side. So I think the... Right. Uh, Maitini, do you have anything... I just wanted to say, I mean, that's that works in in like institutional or places where there is an institutional structure, but so much of the learning goes on in a more informal setting, right? Yeah. And it's like, and the problem is accountability. Like you're saying, if ICCR would um, place things like this on record for the artists, or you know, like institutions that promote artists or that present concerts, if they hold accountability and stop presenting artists, that, you know, but then again, it's that. They have to be. They have to take up accountability and responsibility, and and there cannot be this division between. Okay, but they're a wonderful artist, but they're doing yeah, this stuff. You know, exactly. so we okay. need more. Of it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'm afraid that we, that's all the time we have for today. We are out of time. This is a this is a really interesting, burning, hot topic, mm -hmm. and we could go on uh, for the entire day. Or or night wherever you are, depending on which part of the world you're listening in or viewing it from. Um, I want to thank both of you, Maitri and Samarth, for joining us, for joining Samvad, for this very, very important conversation. Let this conversation not end here. Let it continue in our own spaces where we practice, where we interact with our gurus, where we uh, perform. Uh, it all matters. So all we can do is start the conversation and then take individual responsibility to take it forward. Uh, so thank you, both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mesma. Was... Thank you, yeah. And Samar, thank you. Yeah, both <laughs> of you. This is a wonderful discussion. And as, as Mesma said, this it, it's not over. The conversation has to keep continuing. Well, that brings us to the end of our first public conversation at Samvad Boston. Tomorrow is Vijaya Dashmi an important day in the Guru Shishya Parampara, where the Guru teaches the Shishya a new lesson. It's a day of a new beginning. Uh, so I hope that this conversation served the purpose of a new lesson for all of us. And I also hope that uh, you will like our Samvad Facebook page because there is strength in numbers and that you will subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, do join us for our next conversation on Saturday, November 21st, at the same time. And the topic for that conversation will be our Indian classical dance forms, the appropriate medium to address social and political issues like inequality, prejudice, immigration, gender bias, etc. In other words, is the marriage between art and politics a happy one? Thank you for joining. Until the next time, from all of us at Samvad Boston, goodbye.